The contemporary conceptualization of language in most linguistic disciplines is that language is a system. Through constant use of language over time, its users have created a set of basic rules for use and meaning. These sets of rules, or codes, provide the user with a basic framework for communication, which in English we call grammar. The creation of grammar in a language is not a single act. A motivated scholar of language cannot pinpoint a moment in history where a language had formed its particular system of grammar. Rather, through the use of language, grammar, meanings of words, and the way we use them change to suit the context. In that way, we can think of language as a self-constructing system. Speakers of the language define the rules, and rules define the way speakers use the language to communicate. If a new context arises where the structure of the language isn't meeting the needs of the users, then the language and its users will organically adapt to the new scenario. Like the rise of internet gaming, players were restricted by the need to communicate while keeping their attention on gameplay, so they substituted numbers for letters, shortened words, and adopted a more terse syntax to meet the demands of their new communication environment. The use of language and its structures don't always change so passively. Oftentimes, instead of reacting to a novel language environment, users will consciously dictate the rules and meanings of language to secure a specific outcome. Whether or not we are aware, governments and those in positions of power around the world have been dictating who, what, when, where, and why we use language for quite a long time and in a variety of ways. These purposeful acts on a language or its users by a governmental entity are known as language policies. A language policy is a mechanism that impacts the structure, function, use, or acquisition of a language. This includes 1. Official regulations. These are often enacted in the form of written documents and are intended to affect some change in the form, function, use, or acquisition of language which can influence economic, political, and educational opportunity. 2. Unofficial, covert, de facto, and implicit mechanisms connected to language beliefs and practices that have regulating power over language use and interaction within communities, workplaces, and schools. 3. Not just products, but processes – policy is a verb, not a noun – that are driven by diversity of language policy agents across multiple layers of policy creation, interpretation, appropriation, and instantiation. 4. Policy texts and discourses across multiple contexts and layers of policy activity, which are influenced by ideologies and discourses unique to that context. From this definition, we can already see that language policy and planning, or LPP as it's known, is necessarily complex. This intricacy is reflective of the complex nature of language formation and its uses or functions in social systems. The Mandarin-only policy put in place by the Kuomintang Party in Taiwan is an interesting example of de jure policies and the de facto practical ramifications. First, a little background. Flash back to the late 1600s, successive dynasties in mainland China vied for power over a small island then known as Formosa due to its abundance of natural resources. In 1683, it was made a province of the mainland by the ruling Qing dynasty, which subsequently established a local government and infrastructure. In 1895, Imperial Japan wrested control of the island from the Qing dynasty in the Sino-Japanese War. Policies of Japanization, including rigid policies on language education, were adopted on the island to mold local people into loyal subjects of the Japanese emperor. The Japanese occupation of the island of Taiwan continued for the next 50 years until the end of the Second World War. In 1945, the Kuomintang Party of the then Republic of China took control of the island from the Japanese. Governor General of Taiwan Chen Yi enacted a policy which replaced Japanese with Guoyu, literally national language, as the official language of the island. He said, Now that I have arrived on Taiwan, I intend to first bring teachers of the national language and national characters to prepare them for the purpose of coming and enabling our Taiwanese comrades to comprehend and understand their ancestors' culture. 
this task must be pursued with hard resolve the same as my experience in fujian province when i promoted national language mobilization with this proclamation the kuomintang or kmt party strictly enforced the use of mandarin chinese with traditional characters in schools government and the media the kmt are not the only government in history to enact such policies in France, the Toubon Law was passed in reaction to the rapid ascension of English as the dominant language in the international theater in the late 1900s. Before World War II, French was not only an international lingua franca, hence the term, but a language that projected an air of prestige and intellectualism on the speaker. The French government saw the influx of English language colloquialisms as a decimation of the French language, and therefore of the French national identity and heritage. On the 1st of July, 1944, the French Senate passed the Toubon Law, which expressly forbid the use of English and any other foreign language elements in commercial activity, such as advertising, radio broadcasts, film, and even internal communications in businesses in France, stating, Tout document contenant des obligations pour l'employé ou des dépositions dont la connaissance est nécessaire à l'exécution de son travail doit être rédigé en français. Interestingly, the law also sought to remedy what was viewed as deficiencies in prior language policy legislation called the Law Balloriel. This law was also meant to prevent English language encroachment into commercial and industrial domains. According to the law, all advertising and publicity, instructions for use of products, and signs for the public were to be in French. All work contracts were to be in French. Terminology commissions were set up in every ministry from 1970 onwards so that new technologies and systems would not be designated by English terms. In Taiwan, the enforcement of the Mandarin-only law was strict and in many cases brutal. Students were beaten and shamed if they were caught speaking any native dialect. Outside of the classroom, the sinicization of Taiwan was enforced through martial law, beginning a period of violence known as the White Terror. The KMT's motives for declaring a national language were purely political. Their motives were to reverse the previous trends of Japanization with their own language-centric indoctrination processes. The party connected the ability to speak Mandarin with patriotism and loyalty to the government, thus making the use of loyal dialects or Japanese unpatriotic. After the Chinese Civil War in 1949, this language policy became synonymous with support of the KMT and the ROC over the victorious Chinese Communist Party as the temporary displaced yet rightful rulers of the mainland. The democratization of Taiwan was a turning point. Not only were citizens now allowed to speak Taiyu and other indigenous languages, but the new opposition party brought with it a platform promoting the use of Taiwanese and policies of bilingual education to back it up. Once elected, these officials directed educators to develop curricula offering instruction at the elementary level for a few hours per week in each region's local language, corresponding to the language spoken by the majority of residents in a school district. This new curriculum was finally implemented in 2001. Taiwanese identity embedded in Taiyu is a primary example of bottom-up processes against a top-down policy, because before martial law was lifted on Taiwan, the KMT managed to marginalize Taiyu as a vulgar language, only used by people of low socioeconomic status through media representation on TV programs and in films, in order to emphasize a common Chinese identity. With this, the new democratic structure of Taiwan began to pair the idea of speaking indigenous languages and multilingualism with a new, uniquely Taiwanese national identity. I know that when you say Taiwanese, there are a lot of different groups and my family they have been in Taiwan for 300 years so I can really t I mean, people can ask are you are you native Taiwanese okay I, I'm not a tribal uh, um, residence but we uh, definitely in in, in, Thai, in in my home I, I can speak Taiwanese so that considers for my family that's considered as a, they call it true Taiwanese culture so the way we eat we, I, in a, outside we speak Mandarin, at home we can speak Taiwanese. Unfortunately, I can reteach teach my son that Taiwanese, but that's a unique culture. I, I can tell him that when people ask you, you're Chinese from China, you say you're 
from Taiwan. He knows it. He will tell people this is a small island it's called Taiwan. So this, they make a difference. The opposition party was made up of local Taiwanese citizens. Their platform of reintroducing and removing the shame from local languages came from their perspectives at the grassroots level. This need of the people to say, I am Taiwanese and these are my languages, carried itself from the streets into the halls of government. It is now an unspoken rule that Taiwanese politicians must speak local dialects to be taken seriously. See here how several prominent politicians, including the current president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, greet the audience in Mandarin and several local languages. Now well into the new millennium, the next generation of young Taiwanese are struggling to come to terms with their new Taiwanese identity in a linguistic system still dominated by the use of Mandarin and the looming control of the mainland. When they ask me if I think Taiwan is a part of the mainland, I just say we're all ethnic Chinese, but that Taiwan is different from the mainland. Rapping in a mixture of Taiwanese, Hakka and Mandarin language, Ko Cho Ching say they have no plans to head across the strait. More important for them is nurturing homegrown talent and qualities that will differentiate them from China. We incorporate a lot of Taiwanese elements and music into our songs. We want people to hear this and instantly know that it's from Taiwan. It's a brand of thinking that they hope will remain popular. In a global context, a variety of examples from various nations seem to suggest that language policy should follow a trend being set by global development practices, design thinking, humanitarian aid work, and conflict transformation practices in that to be successful, policies must be focused on the needs and practices of the people first. Top-down, de jure policies that try to influence the national identities of a population only plant a seed. What truly influences how that seed grows is its environment. The context in which the seed grows will inform its characteristics, no matter how strictly the planter of the seed tries to exert their dominance on it. Any top-down policy practices must be grounded in the realities of the language use at the grassroots level, and at best would reflect the nuance of most localized language systems, lest it be subverted in practice by language users. This effect can be seen in the Urdu-Hindi script wars in British India. Starting from the early 19th century, a young British India, still under colonial rule, struggled to agree on a singular national language, one that would promote and validate an Indian national identity. At the time, two major languages, both variants of the colloquial Hindustani language spoken across India, were vying for recognition as the dominant language and the political power that came with it. The competition for the national language caused cultural and political divides as each side conflated their preferred language with cultural and historical meaning in an effort to win recognition and political power. The differing camps of Hindi and Urdu languages came to represent the Hindu and Muslim populations respectively. The Hindu population valued a Sanskritized version of the Hindi language using the Devanagari script. They argued that Sanskrit and its accompanying Devanagari script was best suited to represent Hindu culture and had a long history as symbolic of the Hindu faith. The Muslim community, in contrast, argued for the adoption of the Urdu language with a Persian script, owing to its prevalence in the region via previous Arabic conquests of the Indian subcontinent and its geohistorical connections with the Mohammedan culture and religion. The symbolic conflict between languages fed into growing separatist sentiments and provided the linguistic landscape for the partitioning of British India into the two modern states of India and Pakistan. 
Pakistan declared Urdu its national language and lingua franca in 1948, and a newly independent India declared Hindi with Sanskrit characteristics to be its national language in 1950. One survey shows this relationship between Mandarin as the language of the system and Taiyu as the language through which national identity is formed. The majority of respondents were between 20 and 30 years old and came from both the northern and southern parts of Taiwan. In both the construction of and the responses to the survey, the effects of the Mandarin-only policy were very clear. For the survey to be intelligible, it was written in traditional Chinese characters. 95% of respondents reported that they had native-level speaking fluency in Mandarin. Respondents also spoke Mandarin at home, with friends, in their workplace, and considered it their mother tongue. The framework set by the policy has created a framework for the economic and social lives of participants that operates predominantly, if not exclusively, in Mandarin. In that regard, the KMT policy has accomplished its goals on the surface, to create a dominant lingua franca. As Isaac Newton once said, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The same seems to be true in terms of the actions taken by the pre-democratic Taiwanese government and the formation of a unique national identity by the people of Taiwan in the following years. When asked, using what language makes you feel the most Taiwanese? 66% of respondents chose the Taiwanese language. More than half considered speaking Taiyu personally important, and 67% reported that it is important to very important that their government representatives speak Taiyu. This suggests that Mandarin usage does not entirely contribute to participants' sense of national belonging. Taiyu is still the language that grounds their identity in place and time, whereas Mandarin is ultimately an emotionless utility. What can be concluded is that for the participants of this small survey, and for residents across Taiwan, their linguistic lives are far more complex than can be explained either in a single language or by a single language. The multilingual nature of the Taiwanese context has a stronger influence on the national identity of the population than one language in particular.